Good afternoon. My name is Jim Conlon and welcome to the latest episode of our sports show. As you know, we've been pre- premiering and previewing on air, live on radio for the last month or so about our upcoming uh, sports uh, documentary, Global Rugby Legends, where we're speaking to iconic rugby players from the Northern Hemisphere and the Southern Hemisphere. So players from France, Scotland, England, Wales and our own Ireland. And obviously players in from New Zealand, Argentina and Australia and uh, South Africa. I'm delighted today to be joined for this episode by a, a, an all-time Australian uh, rugby legend, a rugby World Cup uh, finalist. Uh, he scored more than 1,000 points in Super Rugby, 500 test points uh, for the Wallabies. Uh, he was named in the Super Rugby Player of the Year, uh, and he was the 2006 captain of Australia. And... Um, 09, he became the outright uh, Super Rugby history point scorer of all time, surpassing Andrew Mertens. Uh, 2000, and, uh, he's also played for the Brumbies, 117 appearances, 1,019 points. He's 23 appearances for the Rebels as well, 17 points. And for Australia, from 2000 to 2009, 80 appearances and 489 points. Uh, the one and only uh, Sterling Marklock. And uh, Sterling... Um, Thanks for joining us uh, there today, this morning. It's great to have you on, uh, Sterling. An iconic uh, sort of career for you was sort of such in ter- terms of rugby. But tell me, growing up as a young boy, did you, uh, speaking to Joel and uh, Eust uh, van der Vestes, and they told me they were a lover of all sports. They tried their hands at everything, whether it was cricket, football, golf. Were you the same or were you very much embedded in rugby from a young age? Yeah, firstly, James or Jim, it's great to be here, mate. Um, it's a fantastic question, um, and I guess I'm more similar to to those guys that um, I played everything. I, I loved all sports when I was young. I did, however, um, start playing at rugby at a really, really, really young age. Um, I don't. I'd actually still don't think I've met someone that, that started playing rugby younger than me. So um, my story was that uh, my older brother uh, was going to enrol in the under sevens. And he was three years older than me, and uh, I was in the car went with my dad. And at the registration desk, they asked Dad, "Am I registering?" And Dad looked at me and said, "Do you want to play?" And I said, "Oh, okay." So uh, I ended up having my first season in the under sevens, and I was four years of age. So I played three seasons in the under sevens until I started playing with guys my age. Um, so rugby is something that, that was, you know, I guess in my DNA and something that I've always played. Um, and love. However, uh, I played all sports growing up. I even played, uh, you know, football at primary school. Uh, I was a, a striker in that in, in that soccer team, and um, yeah, I was into everything: athletics, um, basketball, cricket, you name it. I, I really enjoyed sport, um, and it was only really when I left school um, and started university where I probably had to make a decision. I was playing basketball and rugby at the same time and I had a actually a really decent uh, ankle injury in basketball I, I, I wrecked all the ligaments in my, in my ankle and had to rehab that for a long period of time and then I made the call well maybe I might uh, focus on rugby for a little bit and that's that's sort of where things took off and Sterling were you academically uh, bright you mentioned there in university could you have taken on a full-time professional uh, academic uh, career in terms of before deciding to go full-time as a rugby professional were you venturing down other different avenue career paths uh, were you always open-minded in terms of that if rugby hadn't uh, worked out for you yeah I was certainly um, you know I went to Sydney University I was, I was studying a science degree and my mindset was to potentially um, go and do physio or medicine um, as a, in postgrad, I guess. And so I ended up majoring biochemistry and physiology at, at, at uni. Um, and I was very lucky that I had to sort of extend my my last year and a half out by a few years because rugby took off. Um, but I I um, I wouldn't say I was you know uh, the best at, academically, but it, it was something that 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 that, that I enjoyed studying. And enjoyed going to university, and then I guess whilst I was playing professionally, I ended up, I ended up started doing an MBA, but that didn't work. And then I did a graduate diploma in applied finance, and that sort of led me on the path to where I'm in now, more in the sort of uh, 
you know, I was working in the banking finance sector and now I'm back in the sports investment and advisory sector. So, um, yes, yeah, so I wouldn't give myself a wrap and say I was, I was uh, had a lot of academic prowess, but something that I enjoyed doing. And certainly from my, from my perspective, when I was playing professionally, I wanted to have something else to, to, to focus on and something else to lean on if and when, you know, my rugby career finished. And uh, Sterling, uh, the importance of Rod McQueen when he came uh, Wallabies uh, coach, because he plucked you out in terms of the Super Rugby Series at, at a young age of 20 and thrust you into that tour of Argentina. And obviously he saw something that you, uh, something about you at a young age and you were, uh, you, were, you were taken even before you were with under 21s of Australia. But you had played, I, I imagine you had played underage for Australia as well, had you? Yeah, so I think the sequence for me was I played Australian in the 19s and in the following year, Australian in the 21s. But, and I think by the end of that year was when I got picked. Um, so I still had another another year of under 21s the following year, I think. Mm. Uh, that would make sense, yeah. So um, it just, just happened that, um, you know, I was playing first grade for Gordon in an amazing era. Uh, Gordon, Gordon first grade won the premiership in 95. Uh, and that was my first year out of school. I left school in 94. So 95, I was playing the Colts under 21s at the time for Gordon. And I actually had two seasons at, at Gordon Colts, um, which, which doesn't really happen a lot with a lot of the young talent that we have nowadays. A lot of, a lot of the kids that, that are, are, are earmarked to potentially play professionally often miss those years in Colts. But for me, it was fantastic. Um, I have a lot of great mates that I made. Um, in in those two years at Colts, and then also my coaches had a huge influence over my development at, at Gordon, and then also throughout my career, they were sort of mentors to me all the way through when I went to professional. But going back to um, Rod McQueen, that year in '97, I was playing first grade for Gordon. Gordon had won the premiership in '95. Uh, we were we were going very well. We were make we win the semis. I think we beat Randwick in, in one of the semis. And I managed to have a, have a, a big game at the time. Uh, I think Matt Burke, who was the fullback, uh, had injured his shoulder. So there was sort of a, an outside back spot that was, that had opened up. And I didn't even think about it because, you know, I hadn't played professionally or hadn't played for the, for, for any super rugby team at the time. And, um, then Rob McQueen called me up and I had to ask him about four times, who is this? And eventually I believed him. Um, and yeah, I went on that tour and that tour was just a, just a phenomenal experience for a, for a young 20 year old that, you know, I hadn't, had never met these guys, John Eels, Stephen Larkin, Joe Roth, um, Richard Harry, or, you know, just, just amazing, amazing legends in Australian rugby. And, and the next thing I was, you know, playing and training with them. Um, and I think, you know, other guys like, you know, Timmy Horror and Jason Little, who were just, just freaks. Um, it was pretty surreal. And you mentioned that joining uh, when you did in terms of that, that tour in 2000 and making your test uh, debut against Argentina on the back of Australia just becoming uh, world champions uh, in terms of 1999 as well. So obviously you're going into a locker room there of full of winners and larger than life characters. Did you feel straight off that you had to make your own impression and stand on your own two feet that nothing was going to be taken for granted even coming in at a young age that you show your mirrors and show why you deserve to be there? Yeah, because I had, um, I guess my career in general, I had a lot of injuries that plagued my career and it even happened in those first, first early years before I cracked it into the Australian team. So in, in 98, I had a few injuries in and around the season, uh, minor, um, minor surgery on my, on, on my knee. I had to have twice that season, um, but I actually sat on the bench in one of the World Cup qualifying matches in 98, but didn't actually get on the field. And then 99, I was sort of, I guess, uh, back in those days, they didn't pick really extended squad, squads. You had the, the starting 22 and then you had a few shadow players. So I was a shadow back in the first test match and then I got injured again, injured my shoulder. So pretty much, you know, 98, 99 for me was very close. And then 2000, by that, by that stage, I'd, I'd had, you know, it was my third proper season of Super Rugby under my belt playing for the Brumbies, which, which was a phenomenal team. And we had a great season. 
unfortunately, um, it fell one short in the final, and you know I had a had a, had a bit of a hand to play in that. I was a kicker, and I missed a, a number of goals goal that day in the final. That one of those kicks had gone over, we would have won. We only lost by um, it was a really tight margin. Um, but by the time I got picked to actually play for Australia in the Wallabies in 2000, I felt like um, I was ready to play at that level um, and wanted to go out there and, and give it my all. And so that's that was certainly the mindset. Whereas I think if I had been picked, you know, in certainly in '97 or even in '98 and '99, I would have potentially may have been doubting whether I was actually ready to, to play it and capable of that level. Um, certainly in 2000, I wasn't of that mindset. I was absolutely ready to go out there and rip it up. Um, I wasn't a wing, though, so that was the one challenge to me. Um, I was an outside back. Predominantly, I was playing fullback early days and and then 13 for, 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 a, pair, for a fair period of time. Um, I didn't feel like I had as much speed on the wing as other wingers. So that was, that was a challenge for me to make sure that I didn't get shown up. Um, and I, I don't think I really ever did, which is, which is, which is a, a, a plus. Yeah. And I suppose Sterling playing in club rugby where you have George Gregan uh, beside you as well. And obviously he was in the international team. I know you succeeded uh, George Gregan as captain, but in terms of seeing your club mates and your teammates, uh, lift that World Cup uh, Jewel Ellis Trophy in 1999. Uh, obviously, you got to World Cup final yourself in uh, 2003, obviously losing Neil. Have you any sort of regrets, even that, even if you were on that panel, that you would probably still have a World Cup medal to your name? Or did you feel at that time that, obviously, Australia having won the World Cup, that opportunities will come about for you in the near future again? Or uh, did you feel that many of that side would be there for the next two or three World Cups that won in 1999? Yeah, look, I, I felt at the time that, that, that 99 was going to be a, a challenge, one that I felt like if I was, if everything went my way, I, I could have made that team. And then obviously that's well before, you know, how, the success of, of that campaign and that team. Um, but I guess from my, the trajectory of my career and how things played out, um, I've already mentioned that, that injuries happened. So I, I ended up having, uh, I think it was, I think we, we've counted. I think I had 15 seasons of professional rugby and I ended up having 15 operations. So I averaged almost oh. one, a, one a year. Um, so, so there was that component to it. And then, and then also some of those challenges and, and, and injuries or not being involved it actually contributed to me committing harder to, to play for Australia and committing to the Wallabies and wanting me, wanting to drive to be, to, to push for another World Cup campaign. So, um, yeah, I mean, it, I, so that's the one thing I look back and say, what if it would have been amazing to to have won a, a World Cup medal? Um, but I, I feel really comfortable that that I, I did everything in my power to try to do that. Didn't quite get it um, in '03, and obviously in '07 was a very different story, getting kicked out in the quarterfinal um, in Marseille against England. But um, and then I pushed hard later in my career to try to play um, in 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 2011, um, but just sort of just you know, I'd have a significant back injury, had to do a lot of work to get to even be back to even be playing and, and it was a challenge and it's, it's one that I didn't didn't get didn't get picked for. But you know, it, it is what it is. So um yeah, I had a, I was really blessed to have had a great career and, and to have captained your country um is a great honor. And I think if, if we had a one in O three or if I'd have won had been part of the team in not the successful ninety nine team. I may not, may not have hung around because I had, had a, a number of unique opportunities and offers to go offshore um, prior to me getting that, that, that will be captain in, in, in around about 2006 or so. Yeah. And Sterling, in terms of uh, rugby and in terms of uh, 2000, you became the fastest Australian player to reach 100 test points in 2000, created history, the first Australian to score 20 or more points in his four, four consecutive test matches. So in 2000, you really sort of flourish, you were the blossoming player uh, on the block in terms of World Rugby, named uh, Super Rugby Player of the Year as well. Did you feel that you were in that sort of elite category that you were up there with the uh, Brian O'Driscoll at that stage in terms of being uh, the best rugby players in the world at that era in 2000, 2001 because that's where you dance about who is the best centre in the world, is it Brian O'Driscoll or is it Sterling Marklock? 
<laughs> no, I think I think Bod Bod takes that mantle. He, he was a phenomenal uh, performer, and his longevity was unprecedented as well. Um, and also, I always found it really difficult when when we were playing Ireland and marking marking Brian, just just because he he. he he had a knack of turning up at the right place, right time, and just he was sort of, a, I guess, more of a pinball type of player. He'd find the gap, he'd bounce around through contact, and he never really got, you never really got a good shot on him. Um, whereas typically the way that I played, you know, I, I try to run over the top of you and get physically dominant, dominance that way, north, south, and everything else, and try to set up the next phase and whatever. But um, so I think we had very, very different styles. Um, so I don't think I was in, in that. In that echelon, but um, certainly had a, a number of great test matches against him and respected him immensely. Um, but you know, northern northern hemisphere and southern hemisphere, uh, you don't get as consistent matchups. Whereas down here, you know, you play New Zealand two or three times a, a year, so you're marking Tama Umanga or Ma Nonu or Conrad Smith, and you know, you, you get that familiar, familiarity by marking them not just in Test match rugby in the Bledisloe Cup matches, but also in Super Rugby. So um, perhaps, perhaps that's 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 one of the reasons why I didn't get get on top of Bod that too many times as well. I didn't have that familiar, familiarity that I did with a lot of a lot of the Kiwi counterparts or the South African guys. And I suppose Sterling, in terms of the 2003 uh, Rugby World Cup in your home country in Australia, obviously an awful lot of expectation among the supporters coming in as reigning uh, world champions. Obviously, the the semi final, uh, a monumentous moment for you, knocking new, the old traditional rival New Zealand. Uh, you won man of the match an 80 meter intercept uh, try. Were you growing? Growing with confidence uh, coming into that final uh, against England, did you feel a uh, home style after taking down uh, New Zealand, the old enemy in this, uh, the semi final? That uh, everything was falling into place. Yeah, definitely. So I, I guess um, one of the questions we often get asked is, is how did we turn it around? Because in the Bledisloe Cup match at Stadium Australia, the same venue for that semi final, only about three or four months earlier. New Zealand put 50 points on us. Um, and, and I guess I have to give a massive amount of respect to Eddie Jones and the coaching staff. But from that moment onwards, you know, we were, we were slated to play potentially more than likely it was going to be Scotland in the, in the quarters. And, and, and if we got on top of them, then more than likely it was going to be New Zealand in the semis. And so I guess Eddie and his coaching staff dissected why we lost and why we, we really weren't competitive that day and devised a game plan on what we needed to have, what what tactics we needed to have and what um, style of play that we needed to deploy to, to beat New Zealand. And we worked on a lot of those um, attributes for that whole entire time. So by the time we got to the New Zealand game, we categorically knew our game plan and knew what we wanted to do and what we wanted to execute. And it was one of the only games of my whole entire career where you went out, you had the game plan, which is plan A, and that worked perfectly and we just kept on doing plan A. Um, and so that we came off that field with a huge amount of confidence because I don't think anyone in Australia really thought that we would knock off the Kiwis because they were in sensational form. Um, so it was a phenomenal match to be part of, a, a great moment. Um, and I was lucky enough to to get that intercept and, and get get those accolades. But it was a, it's just a unique, from my my point of view, just unique that the game plan, the whole entire team executed it perfectly, and it worked a treat. So that so going into England the following week, you know they had come to Australia the year prior, had beaten us on home soil. They were the form team. They had pretty much had most of their team had been, uh, you know. At least the core of their team had been together for about three or four years. Uh, they had a huge amount of confidence that they could they could get the job done. Um, but we had a huge amount of confidence that, that we're on the rise. So, and the reality is, um, you know, if you have to lose World Cup, I think the way that we did uh, World Cup final um, going down in overtime uh, and, and, and now biting game, it was just a phenomenal game, and 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 and. and and a you know a beautiful moment for for Johnny Wilkinson to step up and do a field goal off his off his wrong foot. Um, as much as that that pains me to say, and 
it, you know, it w we'll always have scars. I'm sure every single person involved with that, that the preparation of the squad have um, what ifs. I certainly do. I think everyone that took the field uh, thinks about moments in the game that if you had done this, maybe we, we would have won. But the reality is it was an amazing final and one that um, we gave it everything we could. And I suppose, Sterling, uh, you do have a Tri-Nation success and the Bledsoe Cup and uh, you scored a winning penalty goal against South Africa and Durban uh, for that wing and Australia's first uh, Tri-Nation's uh, crown in terms of that. But when you look back at some of the iconic players that you've come up against and players that you've played beside, do you feel that you were really in a, a truly golden age of rugby during the 90s, uh, early, late 90s, early noughties, where you had the likes of Joan Alomo, you had Brian Habana, uh, Jules van der Vesthazen was still around, you had Pichot, uh, you had uh, Emile Intimac for France, uh, Johnny Wilkinson, Brian O'Driscoll, uh, Neil Jenkins from Wales. It's, there was all these iconic players that go down in the annuals of rugby and the two played in that era. Would you swap that for anything now? Would you like to be playing in this current era or do you feel that era that you played in and you're invested in that you're very much happy to be involved in the era that you are involved in? Yeah, I definitely feel as though we were blessed that era. A, as you mentioned, just just the, the characters and the legends of our game that transcended and took the, the rugby you know, in its early infancy, infant, yeah, early infancy of professionalism, to just heights that potentially not not many people even imagined. Uh, and you mentioned Jane Alomu. I mean, every kid had the Jane Alomu PlayStation game. And my first ever test match against New Zealand, I was marking him. And you know, I, I'm thankful and, and, and honoured to shared the field with him and, and, and marked him. But certainly when that was the case, staring at him down in the Harker, that was, I wasn't excited about that at all. Um, he was just a phenomenal athlete, a phenomenal, phenomenal player. Um, yeah, so, I, and, and on top of that as well, from, from my point of view, the game is so much more professional and, and, and is, it is faster. The collisions are, are, are just insane. And, and also the amount of uh, diligence that the players need to have in regards to um, foul play and, 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 you know, high tackles and whatnot, which is obviously related to, to concussion and getting on in control of that. But there, there are a lot more pressures on the current players than, than I felt in, in our era. And also the way that the game was played and adjudicated. So there was a period of time in the late 90s and early, early noughties where more rubber the green or license was given to the attacking team. Um, and, and that was fantastic for continuity of rugby. Um, ev eventually in the mid 2000s, world rugby in all their wisdom changed the focus to being more about a, a fair contest at every facet of the game, whether it be restarts, um, you know, scrums and line outs or breakdowns. And so no credence is really given to momentum or did we go over the game line? Did we do everything right? But that was an error. So I, I, I could penalise that, but you guys were on top. You were dominating, so I won't penalise you that. And unfortunately now, um, you know, the players don't have that leeway and don't have that momentum. And, you know, I think it's a big blight on our game um, because I played in, 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 the, in the era where that was, that was how the game was refereed. It was how it was played. And it was so much fun to play. And I guess the, the, the sponsors, um, the crowds and everything reflected that. Um, so, yeah. And uh, Sterling, before I finish up, uh, two quick questions to finish up. Uh, did you just form another question when you mentioned Jonah Lomo there to me, obviously marking Jonah. Was that almost like facing a battering ram? Did you come home with sort of bruises and aches and sort of battering, to physically tackle that man and haul that man to the ground in terms of the effort that it took? Was it almost like... Uh, did you, uh, well, you had to get a double tackle where it was yourself or someone else or did you ever face him down one-to-one -one where it was a case where you had to take him down yourself? Yeah, there's a lot of stories and jokes that have, that have been thrown out there about the best best way to tackle Jonah um, and they're all pretty funny. 
Uh, but, but typically, we, a lot of the guys would deploy the the, the the method of just falling in front of him and hope he fell over us as a speed up. Um, or a few other guys made jokes about throwing th- things at him to just sidetrack him. But the reality is, uh, the, the proper way that the it was to just get him before he had momentum, um, get him before he gets any head of steam up because him angry and him with a full head of steam, it was unbelievable. It was so hard to tackle. Um, because he had enough pace to do it in and away and get on the outside, and, and, and then you're just not going to get him on a low, low legs tackle, but he also had enough, you know, leg drive and momentum to just run straight over the top of you. Um, he was unbelievable. So. Um. Yeah, just crazy memories. I, I actually, re- in particular, remember one match where he made a break, and a, it took about five players to actually finally someone tackled him. I think actually George Brigham might have been one of them in the end who got him, and the crowd all sort of cheered or, or jeered, right? And then he got up off the next phase, and I remember looking at him. He just got up and just ah, and just started like yelling out like a bear. And I looked at one of the teammates. I think it was. I think it might have been actually Rod Kafer and just said, oh, man, we're in for a long night, mate. And, you know, when he was on, you couldn't stop him. It was unbelievable. And Sterling Marklock, finally, for me to you, if you look in the mirror now of the player that you see before you, the player that distinguished uh, his career, how would you sum up uh, Sterling Marklock as a rugby player looking at him in terms of two sentences? Um... I feel like I squeezed every last drop out of what I could do on the pitch and did it with honour and integrity and with passion. Uh, on that note, uh, Sterling Marklock, an absolute pleasure uh, to talk to you uh, today. I uh, forgot to mention 2006, uh, Sterling captained Australia and captained Australia numerous times as well. Played for the Brumbies, 117 appearances, 1,019 pints. Played for the Rebels, 23 appearances, 17 pints. Been most notably known for 2000, that breakout year, Super Rugby Player of the Year. Scored more than 1,000 pints in Super Rugby. 80 appearances for Australia, 489 points, a Rugby World Cup uh, finalist, most memorable that famous intercept try against New Zealand at Rugby World Cup semi-final. Uh, certainly an absolute pleasure talking to you today, reliving some of the iconic moments in your career and uh, great to hear that you had uh, yourself and uh, the centre's uh, unique uh, club, yourself and Brian O'Driscoll have a uh, great respect for each other even to this day. Sterling Marklock, a pleasure. Thanks, Jim.